Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome here uh, Maria Piragovskaya, who is our visiting scholar from the European University of St. Petersburg, an institution which I have taught at and I love personally. Um, and we have a lot of actual uh, back and forth with the European University of St. Petersburg. And hopefully there will be more in the years to come. Stay tuned for an announcement about that sometime soon, I hope. Um, um, Maria is a professor of anthropology from that institution, and she's just been here working on her own projects and also, um, you know, doing a little just an observation of life at, a European, at an American institution. Uh, her degree uh, in anthropology is also from the European University of St. Petersburg, which is a great thing because it really is the best thing happening in Russia these days. Um, and uh, she's the author of a book um, which is titled, it's in Russian, um, but many of you speak Russian, you should look for it. It's called Miasma, Symptoms, and Evidence, um, with a nod to Carlo Ginsburg's uh, writings uh, about 19th century uh, olfactory history uh, in Russia, the history of smells. Um, so please join me in welcoming her. She's going to speak to us today about gender and eating. Two great things. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, is it okay? Is it loud enough? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for the introduction, and I want to thank you personally and the whole Department of Russian and East European Studies for uh, uh, the hospitality and uh, especially Alina Yukubova uh, for uh, organizing all this event. It was great. Uh, so, um, just to start uh, this um, uh, this talk uh, and the paper. It's part of a research project uh, dedicated to the anthropological analysis of uh, late Soviet food and cooking viewed from below, from the level of uh, practice. Uh, and uh, currently this project is based upon uh, 32 interviews uh, with men and women born between uh, 1927 uh, and 1974. Uh, the private book, books were compiled, and additional visual uh, sources from 74 family archives. This information you will see on the slide. Also, some participant observation uh, of several festive occasions recent uh, have been conducted. Uh, the principal method of conducting research was to join an interlocutor in looking through uh, he, her or his private cookbook and her family photo album. And we were discussing problems of uh, housekeeping, cooking, and so on. Uh, these people had had a, a different stages of their lives and in different periods of Soviet era and post-Soviet transition. Today, I focus on the imperative of uh, this ostentatious uh, Soviet table uh, and um, strategies of its construction under the economy of shortages and its probable relations to gender performance and the so-called co-figurative type of socialization. Sorry. Um, what is it? Uh, in her book, uh, Culture and Commitment from 1970, American uh, uh, founding mother of anthropology, Margaret Mead, proposed a free thought typology of intergenerational relationships based on the idea that <coughs> generational interaction depended on past present uh, and future orientations. Mead talks about post-figurative, that is past-oriented, co-figurative, present-oriented, and pre-figurative, future-oriented cultures. Most notably, uh, co-figuration prevails when the second generation uh, loses the connections uh, with the first one, uh, that is from uh, grandparents, uh, due to wars, uh, estrangement, uh, the genocide, or immigration. Young adults in such situation uh, seek advice of their peers and share any important knowledge with each other. I discuss uh, the possible interpretation of the Soviet post-war uh, post food cultures uh, with this uh, notion of cooperation. <coughs> so, um, uh, did, uh, what did uh, the very term Soviet cuisine uh, imply? As interlocutors and scholars agree upon, it was mostly an urban phenomenon. It inherited some features from the 19th century cuisine of Russian bourgeoisie and preserved this heritage despite several rounds of reforms and social changes. What is more important, it drastically differed from peasant cooking, which is never discussed as part of Soviet culinary heritage. What made these two types of cooking different from each other were the degree of variability and the method of memorization and knowledge transmission. As a rule, uh, peasant cuisine 
cuisines around the world use a very limited range of dishes which vary locally and are preserved in transmitted format. On the contrary, urban food ways are based upon broad networks of supply, which is quite natural, uh, both a more flexible and dynamic menus, and rely uh, both on oral and written transmission of cooking knowledge. Handwritten and printed media alike contribute not only to a wider circulation of recipes, but also to a gradual unification. This is how the canonical recipes and menus are forged. Though Soviet cuisine to rely upon a really limited foodstuff, uh, it was essentially urban. Its scarcity was irregular and sensitive to geographic, chronological, and economic constraints. Uh, it resulted not from small-scale agricultural cycle like peasant cuisine, but from the planned economy. Uh, for example, even interlocutors from big cities like Kiev or Leningrad recall both the periods of extreme shortage, uh, for example, of sugar or white bread, uh, and periods of weird abundance of expensive food stuff like crab meat or black caviar. On the one hand, such uh, fluctuations of supply supported the variability and diversity of recipes. If you have nothing but crab meat, you need to learn how to cook it. On the other hand, shortages and the limited range of food stuff reduced the diversity of recipes. Uh, if an ingredient is missing for a decade, uh, dishes based on it fall out from a gastronomical uh, repertoire. Uh, yet uh, another feature of uh, Soviet cuisine made it different from the peasant cucina uh, povera, it's Italian for the kitchen of, uh, kitchen of the poor, and related it to new imperial cuisines, its ethnic diversity. In his recent book, Familiar Strangers, uh, uh, American anthropologist Eric Scott uh, demonstrates how the Georgian feast called Supra uh, and numerous Caucasian dishes were introduced to Soviet international crowd at a big scale by virtue of top Communist Party officials' devotion to Georgian food. However, in this respect, Georgian cuisine was not so exceptional. Under Khrushchev, uh, new national cookbooks uh, were issued in national languages and in Russian Koine as well, along with collections of recipes from countries uh, of the Eastern Bloc translated to Russian. It raises the question, how many actually such cuisines uh, exist? Uh, is it possible to speak about a Soviet Tatar cuisine or a Soviet Lithuanian cuisine? Uh, how did Soviet versions of ethnic cuisine function? If at the same time uh, local varieties, uh, local versions maintained their existence? These are questions yet to be investigated, but in this paper I focus primarily on Soviet version of urban cuisine presented by Russian-speaking interlocutors, <laughs> notwithstanding their ethnic identities and probable uh, multilingual or bilingual status. Uh, how can we learn about uh, private uh, cuisine, this uh, cooking from below? Uh, to a certain extent, it is mirrored in handwritten cookbooks and collections of kitchen notes and ephemera, uh, which are personally customized. Uh, you can see uh, examples here on the slide. Uh, these cookbooks are kept by most uh, women of older generations and preserve both the recipes and models of the desired festive table and those social networks within which these recipes circulated. Another source is visual. Soviet and post-Soviet family photo albums, which I will also mention, keep uh, pictures of the celebrations of the past, such as the New Year, birthdays or wedding parties, anniversaries, and housewarming gatherings. These photos certainly used to be taken with different goals, uh, which did not necessarily include the documenting of festive cooking. Nevertheless, sometimes we depict not only family circles around the table, but also the table itself. From the anthropological perspective, pictures of meticulous laid tables were taken as a specific kind of marking. These snapshots helped memorialize the fleeting beauty of the intact festive table, housekeeping skills of the hostess, and the social status of the family. Years and even decades later, uh, these uh, pictures still have been used to reaffirm this social status and to recall the event in question. Um, what uh, did typical Russian-Soviet celebration imply? The very word zastolia, uh, the noun meaning literally by the table side, stresses the importance of the table. The table used to be the main scene where the sociability was being performed and maintained. In contrast to the fast and humble everyday meals taken at the kitchen table, festive meals were, to be, were taken in the living room, which often doubled as a bedroom and could have been in fact the only room in the Soviet apartment. Uh, the dining table was unfolded and extended with smaller tables, 
all available chairs uh, were collected around and even borrowed from neighbors. Uh, low sofas were transformed into extra seats uh, with pro pillows. Imported china and heavy check of uh, crystal ware. Uh, here is also this. Um, uh, never used on routine occasions, uh, were put, uh, 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 put on the table. Host emptied out their pantry to prepare numerous dishes out of cannet and tinned fish, pickled vegetables, saved up salami and cherry jam. Ordinary foodstuffs like potatoes, carrots, herrings, chicken and eggs had to be magically transformed into festive dishes for complex cooking methods and highly <laughs> ornamental design. Those of us who are eating a uh, uh, salad can, can understand it. Uh, another important rule demanded that food remains in huge abundance until the very end of the party, that is for several hours. Uh, it's not an exaggeration. It means that the table setting used to be the condition of celebration, the evidence of its ritualized scenario, and the conversation piece of itself. It was vividly discussed and praised aloud. Uh, from the very start, the festive table uh, was covered with plates and bowls, while all the subsequent courses were added on to those already, uh, already on, uh, on the table. And in, an interlocutor described the scenario as the following. You can go through uh, the citation. Um, and uh, what is important here, um, uh, that uh, uh, an interview, the interviewer stresses that everybody is mourning, everybody is exhausted by this quantity of food, but nevertheless, they, they continue uh, they continue uh, to eat. Uh, <coughs> please pass me a piece of cake, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, this, I don't know exactly whether it's the right translation uh, pig out, but in Russian it's abjuralova, so it's, uh, it's quite a rude word. Uh, <coughs> Uh, by the time uh, guests um, arrived, uh, dozens of herbs were already put uh, on the table, as I, as I told you. Thus, the very first and important impression of good home and good housekeeping was created. Speaking about her mother's cooking, one of my interlocutors mentioned inaccuracies of a French film adaptation of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's novel, uh, The First Circle. In the movie, what, what is wrong? In the movie, uh, prisoners wore scarves in elegant French manner, and cabinet officials were exquisitely polite, and guests at the home party sat at the empty table with just a vase of flowers and cutlery. Here's the, the very sequence of examples uh, she, uh, 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 she remembers. It's also not worth it. Uh, the interviewer explained, uh, food was brought in and brought out in courses in this movie, I just laughed out, because you know, Russian festive table ma meant that there should be no empty space. Uh, describing the model table in minute detail and commenting on blunders, interlocutors could demonstrate both their knowledge of the right and the wrong, and their skills in domestic <coughs> science and social choreography. You can see uh, the model in question uh, from this picture from mid-70s. Uh, here are tinned salmon and sprats on small, uh, small saucers. Uh, cold cuts um, on plates, bowls of ornamental salads, uh, homemade pickles, uh, <coughs> uh, plus a row of wine and soft drink uh, bottles, including Soviet sparkling wine. Uh, and this picture was shot before guests uh, arrived uh, at the celebration in a very well to do during the pandemic. However, uh, the same pattern uh, could be traced uh, in pictures from student party in the Siberian door. Uh, this one. Office parties from 50s, uh, the, the lower uh, row uh, and 80s, uh, or, party fellow, or, or, or a party of fellow colleagues uh, in uh, Chukotka. It's a uh, far, far, far east of Russia, uh, the uh, upper left angle. Uh, and uh, while parties of office co workers usually followed the model of potluck, as a rule, uh, men bought spirits, uh, women brought homemade food. Let's memorize this distribution. Home-drawn parties used the other scenario. It were hosts who spent and guests who consumed. As I mentioned, there were by all means significant variations uh, in supply, uh, uh, available resources, uh, and standards of living across the Soviet Union. However, the festive abundance was construed as a model one should strive for even in less well-situated urban communities. Uh, and a proper festive table demanded from hosts, from the hosts, significant efforts and well calculated time management. Why? 
because there was no chance to lay the table in double quick time uh, in one or two shopping trips. The coveted table had to be built up step by step, and its construction had to be undertaken well in advance, weeks, maybe months before. Uh, here are, uh, are two uh, citations uh, uh, from uh, interlocutors. Uh, one uh, speaks about how uh, well-to-do friends even managed to get some decent food. Uh, it's post-war uh, post uh, period. But uh, the second one, it's mid-70s, uh, uh, so it's the stagnation period under Brezhnev. Uh, and she speaks, one could find food in Leningrad. To buy food meant very specific efforts, nothing similar to our days. Uh, it's an, in an interview from 2011. Now you make courses and bring back home, so that's it, you earn and spend. Back then, you had to find it, to cure it, to get it, uh, in Russian also it's very expressive, uh, that's that, you do, uh, to bring it home. Uh, and uh, we have uh, the hosts uh, squandering their stock, this precious food, uh, and just uh, devouring it. So the celebration recalled both uh, breaking the Orthodox uh, lantern and conducting potlatch ceremony. People ate much more than they routinely did. They uh, tried every dish and thus honoring hosts' efforts was an indispensable element of appropriate guest behavior. Hosts, in their turn, spent not only their stores, but also their resources of time and money in creating and supporting sociability, which would be reciprocated by their friends and relatives, who in a while were to assume the host role themselves. So it was very, uh, a very strong rule of reciprocity. Uh, in cross-cultural perspective, um, this model of celebration dining could be considered by an outgroup as superabundant. For example, at the turn of the late Soviet and early post-Soviet eras, uh, a number of food nar narratives described the Soviet domestic abundance in contrast to Western scarcity. Uh, uh, these narratives were created both by immigrants who had an experience of Western European or American exuberant food markets, and by Soviet citizens who managed to sleep through the cracks in the crumbling iron curtain and travel to old capitalist countries. Consumerist cultures of the West stirred in newcomers and tourists complex emotions of enthusiasm, delight, and bewilderment. Yet at the same time, American or European home or community celebrations were sometimes described by tourists and immigrants as humble or scarce. Uh, what made people feel uneasy was how the table used to be set. Narrators mentioned an, is, an insufficient amount of victuals, although they had different explanations for it. The same issue of abundance versus scarcity was raised by some of my interlocutors, who, amidst the conversation on their relatives or friends abroad, let sleep, albeit unwillingly, a word or two about strange habits of treating guests at the empty table. <laughs> they apparently found such habits odd and embarrassing. But we also apparently considered the own embarrassment very embarrassing due to the very sensitivity of the topic. Some interviewees mastered several gastronomical languages and could transmit socially different messages through them. For example, uh, one interlocutor from the family of a top Communist Party official used to work uh, as an interpreter and had the rarest and possible opportunity to go abroad in the cruise shop and Brezhnev years. She befriended some foreigners and even welcomed them to her apartment in Moscow. As a Soviet woman, she had her own handwritten cookbook in which she used to inscribe recipes taken from Soviet and European colleagues and her own festive menus. There was an intriguing difference between those menus. Um, her uh, menus for, for foreigners were elegant but very laconic, like three uh, courses, three dishes, brought into accordance with her idea of the then current Western table. There she presented herself as a Westerner. On the contrary, her menus for her Armenian Russian kin and Moscow friends were exuberant, following the same pattern that was abided by other ordinary Soviet citizens. Multiple cold starters, salads, one or two main dishes, and an ornamental cake to finish the evening. There is a Napoleon just in the back row. Uh, please have it. Moreover, um, this superabundant model does still exist uh, against the new non-Soviet background right now. In cities situated as far from each other, politically and geographically, uh, as Riga, Moscow, Almaty, or Blagovetsk, uh, this picture was taken in February uh, two months ago in Blagovetsk uh, by a friend, um, 
people of the generation still maintain the Soviet model to treat their children and grandchildren in a distinctive, old-fashioned and exuberant manner. Uh, and uh, vice versa, mm, grandchildren can reconstruct such a table to impress their senior relatives. One interlocutor, a professional private cook based in Moscow, proudly cited an order in style of uh, 1952 edition of the book of Tasty and Healthy Food, the Russian, the Soviet Kitchen Bible. Uh, this order he had got re recently for the 19th anniversary of the client's grandmother, who had formerly belonged to the Moscow Party elite. Uh, and uh, there was a quite extensive list of Olivia salad, smoked pot salad, potato salad, and simple fried mushrooms, boiled veal tongue with coarse variety dressing, pipe perch and aspic, Bajarsky chicken cutlet as an entree, sturgeon and baked potatoes and bechamel sauce as another entree, and Napoleon cake. It is remarkable uh, that the initially proposed menu um, uh, included half as many dishes, uh, only two uh, uh, appetizers and one entree. But the client, obviously familiar with the model of festive meals and aware of his brain's expectations, asked to augment their quantity. Uh, narratives about striking differences um, between Soviet and Western festive dining uh, embody a very typical discourse on the other and the otherness. The imaginary cultural, communal, or national identity can be constructed and corroborated in many ways and through many media. The juxtaposition of our food and our food habits versus their food and their food habits is just one of them. But what meaning did an abundant table convey for us? And who are these us? Uh, social scenarios of treating a guest or organizing a dinner may significantly vary. For example, a uh, guest may be invited to try a dish, but it could be compromising or even threatening to social self to accept immediately, without any hesitation not to mention starting to eat or pour wine without invitation. In the same way, there are social rules concerning setting the table, um, organizing um, a reception or an informal dinner, uh, and dictating the, very, dictating the very amount of food on the plate. Did the empty table, which would be expectable or at least tolerable under the constraints of the econ economy of shortage, compromise Soviet costs and why? Was the abundance a strong rule with hardly possible exceptions? Was this rule of abundance inherited, inherited from the food waste or the food waste of the past, or did it emerge in you in a specific time and space? The simplest explanation here is structural. Uh, the idea of abundance was constructed with numerous plates, uh, and the idea of festivity was implied by specific food design. Thus, both special and visual organization of the table helped structure uh, the feast in contrast to routine meals. Another explanation is diachronic. Uh, the Soviet model is reminiscent of the so-called French habits, uh, or service à la française, uh, which had taken hold in Renaissance France uh, as a method to visualize, visualize wealth. In early 1830s, this 300 years old French model gave way to the so-called Russian model, service à la russe, which adhered to the strict of service and demanded more servants, so it was more posh and uh, uh, demanding. Its aristocratic air made its reputation in Western novel homes. However, bourgeois, uh, bourgeois cuisine, both Western and Russian, borrowed aristocratic Russian model and simplified it into a healthy and thrifty trio of soup or salad, entree and dessert, which could be prepared by a single kitchen maid or a handy housewife. It was this model that the routine Soviet meal, which used to be prepared by a working woman after her working hours, was based upon. On the contrary, based occasions revitalized some principles of the visually impressive French model, along with the principles of the more complicated Russian model. But it was the mistress of the house, and not servants, who had to follow the updated scenario of fine dining. A uh, similar mixture of elements uh, could be discovered in leading Soviet cookbooks, including the towering book of tasty and healthy food. Since 1952, when its canonical colored fifth edition had been published, its uh, uh, very famous uh, uh, fly leaves from it, um, this, uh, this book demonstrated abundance uh, in its uh, very lavish um, and British illustrations, but mostly, uh, mostly on this uh, front and back um, uh, fly leaves. 
And uh, these illustrations stirred very strong emotions in Soviet reading audience. Uh, it's a uh, uh, post-war uh, generations. So uh, one citation. Uh, did you read this book? Uh, I did not read. Uh, I did not um, uh, read it. I looked for pictures. Definitely, I lifted for pictures when I saw this abundance. Did you have anything similar at home? Similar? No, never. Okay, one position could appear on rare festive occasion. For example, salmon caviar. Sometimes mom cooked the filthy fish, but it didn't look as the one on the fly leaf. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and um, um, it is quite plausible. Sorry. It is quite plausible that the book of tasty and healthy food had um, uh, somehow uh, um, introduced the model, reintroduced the model of ostentatious tasty table um, from uh, based upon its pre-revolutionary um, sources and fitted within the new framework of Soviet culinary utopia, this new Soviet wealth that we have. Such a logic is not unnatural for the bourgeois turn of the late 30s when the first edition was published um, and uh, this edition, along with the following ones, uh, transmitted uh, very distinctly this utopian uh, message. Uh, remarkably, some advice uh, in the book uh, betrayed the invisible presence of a kitchen maid or well-trained servant whose duties were openly or indirectly delegated to hostess. Also, same bourgeois recipes flourished in the kitchens of Moscow fine dining restaurants, which were few in number and out of reach for an average Soviet citizen. Pictures um, from these restaurants demonstrate ornamental salads, chicken and veal cutlets, pork escalops, uh, and fancy cakes of jellied fruit and flambe ice cream, which interspersed menus of metropolitan Tsanay, Praga, Ukraina, and other uh, Moscow, uh, Moscow um, posh places. Of course, restaurants' impact on private cooking might not have been huge. However, they preserved and presented prestigious models which were disseminated through uh, popular magazines and posters. And it is also remarkable that since Khrushchev's era, uh, it is uh, early 50s, uh, these dishes and recipes were widely used in home festive dining. Furthermore, festive dishes prepared and served in private homes demanded semi-professional cooking skills and creativity and manifested substantial investments of time and money. For hosts, they provided a way to impress, to create value out of nothing, and last but not least, to mask the humble ingredients the festive dining primarily consisted of, like beetroot or potato. Uh, both necessary preparations and cooking were predominantly performed by women. Getting, literally dust tight, uh, queuing, bartering, asking for favors, storing up and making do were considered specific female competencies, if not female duties. Uh, these relations between lavish table settings and gender scenarios in the late Soviet era are yet to be explored, and this talk is a, a step in this direction. The starting point is the notion of the double burden which implied full-time work on the one hand, motherhood and housekeeping on the other. Despite the rhetoric of emancipation, specific Soviet gender contract confirmed female responsibility for home and family under terms to domesticity in late 1930s and late 1950s, respectively. State issued advice literature on housekeeping and cooking and encouraged women to follow scientific recommendations and modern technologies, which would help them to do housework more effectively. In reality, it meant that scientifically reorganized and ex expertly recalculated housework was ultimately delegated to women solely. They were principal addresses of advice literature and motivational posters, while new fitted kitchens of Khrushchev's housing were designed for a single cook of average height of 5 feet and 2 inches. <laughs> uh, housekeeping, cooking, and making do were important parts of successful gender performance of a genuine woman. So the question is, to what extent this gender contract gained ground in ritualized festive occasions? I start here with uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this screenshot. Uh, from Elder Rizanov's screwball comedy titled uh, Služebny Roman, uh, Office Romance, uh, 1977. Here, one of the uh, supporting female characters, blonde or orange, in the center, uh, embodied the genuine uh, woman of the late Soviet era, in contrast to the leading character of unmarried and ascetic workaholic uh, Lyudmila Kalubina. 
squeezed between her feminine and her job, uh, Polinka tries to look feminine and fancy and tries to support her husband and teenage son. In particular, she spends her short lunch breaks for shopping for food. This was uh, absolutely common practice for all Soviet working women. As the story unfolds, Olenka falls in love with, uh, their ex, uh, with her ex-admirer from their student years, now a deputy chief uh, in her office and a smart social climber. The, uh, when invited with fellow colleagues to a party at his home, she felt, in, she felt impressed by his posh lifestyle. Uh, here the um, camera zooms into uh, imported uh, spirits, uh, American whiskey and uh, Italian Baron of Cinzano. Uh, it's a, just a total, it was a total luxury uh, in the Soviet um, period. Uh, and um, she was impressed and masked it, uh, masked it uh, with teasing. Looking away from the lavish delayed table and declining an extra helping of salad, she explained, I've already tried this dish. I prefer it better than you buy. It should be made with a great apple. <coughs> the salad episode lasts only 33 seconds, but it spoke volumes to Soviet female audience. Um, everybody grasped the emotion behind the scene. Only very strong feelings, possibly of resentment, could make Olinka utter such words to a man. Criticizing the salad was exposing the speaker's expertise. A similar interaction was possible in woman-to-woman -woman dialogue, where it passed for an advice. Woman-to-man dialogues imply criticizing the cook, here the wife of her ex-suitor. The indicated absence of braided apple demonstrated individual and cre creative knowledge of one woman and the lack of it on the part of the other woman, further indicating about not so good gender performance of the mistress of the house in her role of the cook and the host. Uh, further, the, in the same um, screwball movie, the culminating episode also relates food and expected gender performance. The second part of the film shows Ludmila Kabugina, uh, uh, it's a left uh, screenshot, revealing her hidden feminine self as she sets the table for the male protagonist uh, uh, on the right uh, and changes into, in, into an Indian gown clothes. She puts, uh, like, in very uh, it's not bad, but it's just, you know, some, something of an ordinary outfit. And then changes into like, really, uh, you can go to, to get Oscar in this dress. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, gender is displayed here, both uh, through cooking or, and setting the table, given overwhelming uh, for just two eaters amount of food and feminine fashion. Uh, similar setting with a female host uh, laying out an exuberant table for the only male guest opens the plot in another resonant screwball comedy, Pironia Sudbui with Empire, The Irony of Fate or Enjoy Your Bath, 1976. It was the New, Year, New, Year's, uh, it was the New Year's Eve when the principal female character um, demonstrates her competencies in cooking, housekeeping, and dressing up. Uh, for a uh, her fiancé. They are tested and under review. A genuine Soviet woman uh, thus cooks as a mother and then changes into fancy dress as a lover. Uh, interviews uh, show that creating sociability and supporting horizontal milieus of uh, colleagues, friends, uh, relatives, um, uh, 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 co-workers of different time was seen as semi a semi-compulsory part of Soviet female gender performance. Partying was a part of Soviet reciprocity. One had to do it properly. Uh, as uh, one interlocutor uh, you expresses it, hosting a party always meant that you were to make an, an impression. Let me pause for a second to analyze the choice of words here. Woman was to make an impression in cooking, in hosting a party as her social reputation of a genuine woman was at stake. Uh, another interviewer uh, told me about her mother, who had been a paid preschool teacher and had raised two children alone. Notwithstanding her very tight budget, she hosted parties and invited dozens of friends. Here are uh, the uh, quite expensive uh, citation. Uh, I uh, read from the part. Uh, actually, we didn't cook much meat when mom was alive. It was way too expensive. She couldn't afford it even for guests. In contrast, salads can be made out of vegetables and all. Why all um, 
uh, why were all these efforts made? Recent paper um, published uh, in a uh, co co collection called Season Socialism uh, by Anastasia Laktikova claims uh, that it was the lack of praise and self realization in the everyday life of a Soviet woman which made well educated female urban professionals seek a kind of emotional refuge in the kitchen. Following the rules of polite behavior, guests loudly praised the cooking skills of the hostess and thus validated her gender performance. It was her only opportunity to be complimented for cooking, as routine duties, queuing for food, cleaning and cooking as well, were perceived as a norm and were not supposed even to be talked about, let alone loudly praised. However, my interviews and to some extent participant observation allowed to draw a way less rosy picture. Firstly, a loud praise of food was a very tricky question in Soviet urban cultures. Such a praise was apparently expected, but it was often gender-specific. Mostly female guests could do it safely without fear to harm their social selves. Complimenting could go hand in hand with discussing and asking a recipe. In such cases, it was restricted to female conversation only. Uh, secondly, uh, rare male cooks did wait for compliments, but were unwilling to share recipes and to discuss them. One couple explained it in the following terms, uh, male interlocutor. Men could share their recipes only to get kudos. Well, women did it out of kindness. <laughs> uh, female interlocutor. Yes, it's due to women's mutual support. I didn't even understand our friend's uh, it's male cook, refusal to give a recipe at once and continued to ask him. Yes, every woman liked to share her knowledge. Uh, it is a very intriguing question, what kind of kindness made women so willingly share their knowledge? And what exactly restrained men from sharing, uh, from sharing with uh, theirs? Uh, there is some evidence that in case men agree, they were considered effeminate and harmed by masculine gender display. Thirdly, in some social circles, men did not utter a word about the quality of food. Uh, extensive complimenting or simply discussing food and recipes would seem unmanly and inappropriate. Men would pose as worldly wise and, taking up the social role of Mr. His Sin at All, remark on rare or expensive specialties and exotic circumstances. Of course, they could safely discuss drinks. On the contrary, extensive verbal exchange on the kitchen questions was either directly forbidden or considered as boring or petty code. Such conversations were easily interrupted on the pretext of proposing a more appealing, interesting, or serious um, topic without any regard to actual conversational turn taken. Uh, at least part of late Soviet intelligentsia labeled any discussions about food as petty bourgeois, Mishansky Razgabore. It means uh, that the option of promotional refuge in the kitchen was way too fragile to be taken for granted. Yes, the hostess was very often praised, but both her and her guests knew that this praise was an unstable part of the game. I presume that there was a perceptible pressure behind female discussions of recipes, sharing knowledge, and going big on a tight budget. It was felt both by adult peers and by children, by, uh, by little girls. Uh, the latter sometimes rebelled. Uh, for example, an elderly colleague with whom I discussed the Soviet dining declared that she hated both the taste of Soviet pasty food and the family gatherings with their female tedious talks about recipes. Raised in Kyiv in the early 70s, that is uh, quite a well-established and um, respectively fat region of the USSR, uh, as a teenager, uh, she used to sit at the table, dump and frowning as a real teenager, uh, and to deconstruct her meal, creating piles of diced carrots, potatoes, and peas out of mixed Olivia salad. <laughs> in doing so, she literally deconstructed gender expectations imposed on her by her relatives to be sweet, to be sociable, to be skilled, uh, and to uh, do um, uh, festive food uh, and to eat it in, in decent manner. Uh, an important um, feature of these discussions um, about uh, food, about recipes, about uh, the ostentatious table was their homosocial nature. Uh, they um, started within communities of female co-workers during lunch breaks in the office and occupied some family parties. In her group on the floor, Susan Reed notes on loosening of traditional patterns of domesticity by the post-war period. 
and uh, emerging of the new ones. Some studies show that the post-war Soviet generation uh, had, uh, quote, uh, had learned nothing from the mothers about pregnancy or infant, infant care. Unquote. But besides these matters of life importance, in Khrushchev's era, there was a very strong tendency to revitalize domestic science. The state sought to teach young girls and uh, women the basics of housekeeping in line with scientific research and expertise. Domestic knowledge of the previous generations was labeled as anachronistic. Daughters were expected to go home and correct their mother's irrational and atavistic ways. Such discreditation, discreditation along with a new social experience made daughters more susceptible to an expert printed knowledge and to, re and to the recommendations <coughs> of their peers. Uh, while domestic expertise uh, was appropriated by public experts and the domestic labor was reconfirmed as women's work, the post-war generation relied upon printed knowledge, visual models, uh, the book of taste and healthy food in particular, and advice of fellow colleagues, uh, their sisters and gender, uh, who were both models and judges of the right gender performance, including the one expressed for festive dining. Women of the post-war decades were increasingly taught by their friends and co-workers, and in return taught, uh, taught their mothers uh, new recipes of layered cakes and Bulgarian sauteed bell peppers. <laughs> this pattern of knowledge, um, sorry, uh, this pattern of knowledge transmission resembles the one Margaret Mead described as configuration. I have some doubts about Mead's thought on the specific evolutionary sequences and cultures and prefigurative cultures uh, which are indistinguishable from configurative ones. However, her notion of configuration and her explanation of generational breaks seem still uh, applicable and useful for a discussion about knowledge transmission and social bonding around cooking in late Soviet era. Thank you very much. So there's a little more food, and there's some time for questions. Um, and I'm sure there must be questions sparked by this interesting lecture. So who would like to pose one? How, how do you feel that those traditions changed or are still the same now in countries? Or traditions of this level? Yes. Mm, I think that. Um, uh, there are some say, isoglosses, <laughs> kind of isoglosses uh, within society, uh, which uh, demonstrates that uh, this model is maintained by all the generations, uh, part, some part uh, of them. Uh, let us say uh, women uh, of age uh, 65 and more. Uh, it could be reconstructed uh, uh, with some nostalgic, uh, uh, nostalgic drive uh, uh, under it, uh, but they also could be um, laughed upon and, and mocked uh, because they, uh, for some people, with uh, uh, some snobbish or hate. I would, I would like to. Use the other word, uh, not stumbish, but uh, maybe arrogant uh, idea that uh, it was so old, uh, old fashioned, it's outdated, uh, it's not modern. Uh, of course, they, they, they would not consider it nice, uh, decent reason. So, uh, there are different social groups with different ideas about this food, but it still exists, it's, it's very interesting. Um, I don't know the right answer, <laughs> actually. Thank you. <coughs> I was interested in this discussion about who has to like do the like the food collection, um, and I've seen a lot of like literary evidence of the women have to like do all the queuing generally. Mm -hmm. But then, in terms of festive stuff, um, I'm thinking about the. Um, is, it, is it also no? It's um, I can't remember the director, but Maspas is on which has was it. <coughs> Minshaw Fred. So it has the scene with like the men showing up 1950s um, with all of the like the canned crab and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the girls have to transform it in the kitchen before they bring it out. But mm -hmm. 
um, there's like some kind of like male role in getting rare and difficult goods, mm -hmm. which yeah. can also be activated. Is that uh, right? It, it, it was um, because, uh, it, it was related to the fact that. Uh, uh, prestigious food uh, was distributed through a very specific centralized system uh, called uh, festive orders. It means that for, um, uh, for some uh, calendar uh, celebrations, uh, uh, the most useful uh, people of high social utility, according to, uh, to the state, should get some, some decent food like salami, like instant coffee, chocolate, uh, buckwheat, which was uh, a very huge shock shortage in the 70s, um, and uh, uh, the higher the position was, uh, the, the, the better uh, was uh, this order. So the highest positions uh, were mostly uh, occupied by, uh, by males, uh, by men, and that's why uh, it was they uh, are part of this potluck in, in a way. Uh, there is also a very specific male uh, genre of uh, eating out, uh, like <laughs> shashliki, to um, roast uh, <coughs> not in the patio, uh, like it's uh, used in, in, uh, in uh, the US, but uh, in the countryside, uh, in, uh, in the forest, for example. But it's a bit different topic uh, related to the tourism and so on. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you, um, when did this um, I know this situation uh, was always around in different countries and so forth, but when did it change? Because we have a lot of letters in Russian from saying from relatives actually to us asking for coffee and tea and all kinds of things from like the 30s, 37. So I wonder, you know, I think well, was this somewhat of a um, sadistic idea. I mean, you know, I don't think it really took place. Like when I was in Russia in 2002, mm -hmm. 2003, there were many, many older women you know, selling one egg. I mean, it's, it, to me, it seems very incongruous for the reality. Mm -hmm. You know, like, um, like it's like, it's sort of like here, we have so much food, but we're expected to be size zero. You know, it's a, it's a, and my Marilyn Monroe was 144 pounds. Mm -hmm. Now she wouldn't even get a job, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's all available. There's this combination also, really, it's not just food, it's also very connected to women's bodies. Um, and in general, I think ostentatious wealth in Russia, at least from my father's time, was considered terrible, mm -hmm. even if you had the wealth. Mm -hmm. Like my household and so forth, I could see that. So the question is about uh, when did this come along? This no, not so much. When did this propaganda somewhat come uh -huh. along? Propaganda about what? About that this is how life should be when uh -huh. there is no way of making it that. Way. Uh, it's like uh, this, it's so-called uh, the modernization or the modernization term of uh, Stalin uh, Stalin's era in the late thirties. Uh, the book of uh, taste and, and healthy food without that lavish illustrations, but nevertheless with this idea of the utopian uh, plenitude uh, was published in uh, 1939, yeah, just before the war. Uh, just five years uh, before, there was a huge famine in Ukraine. So uh, it, there was no relations between uh, empirical reality and this uh, constructed reality or utopian uh, dimension. Another question about like praising women for the household, mm -hmm. because like showing up at the house and saying, "Wow, great job! There's all this stuff." I can see that's a problem for adults, um, but I'm thinking about teeth enough um, and children's perceptions of the relative status and also uh, well-runnedness of their their peers' households. And I think that there's a, a place where women did actually come in for praise for actually having the house, which you know was always food in the fridge, mm -hmm. the house is always clean, etc., etc. Is mm -hmm. that like an accurate one, or is that just a few like literary <clears throat> tidbits here and there? Uh, like performance of gender for adults is one thing, but for other chil for children, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. different. Yeah, yeah, you may, maybe you're right. Yeah, uh, but uh, these um, gatherings uh, were mostly uh, for peers, that is, adult peers. Yeah. Uh, that's why it was not uh, important. But it, it's interesting whether it's possible uh, um, for... Is it okay for women to be praised uh, 
from her children or, or their uh, classmates, for example, it's strange. I thought they would face her to her face, but... but yeah. Oh, you have a your, nice. your house is the house which is run yeah, well, which is full of food, and mine is not. Uh -huh. um, hmm. They usually take it for granted in any country. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Uh, I think there could be like indirect uh, teaching about um, uh, the right, uh, the right uh, gender performance. Uh, like uh, uh, you should not go uh, into the house and dirty booth because I just uh, cleaned the floor. Yeah. Uh, it's very indirect, uh, but nobody could praise for it. Uh, it's like. There is a uh, the right uh, uh, stuff to do, and you do you are doing the wrong. And if uh, uh, such things are, um, uh, are spoken to a girl, for example, it's also kind of a uh, indoctrination. I think so. Yeah. so another question. I have so many questions. I'm sorry. Yeah, are okay. hostesses allowed to eat? Are they supposed to eat? How much is a hostess <laughs> supposed to eat of her own food? Um, like a host is supposed to drink uh -huh. with the other men. Yes. As much or more. <clears throat> well, what's the host supposed to do in terms of consumption? Uh, if, uh, if she had time. <laughs> <laughs> nobody, no, nobody prevents her from eating if she oh. had time. But uh, if you do all this, uh, er, um, uh, all this. Uh, Errands, right? Uh, instead of a servant, <laughs> is, uh, going around with uh, uh, looking what, what's in the oven, uh, may, may, putting some extra helpings uh, of uh, Olivier in the salad because uh, the wine was out and so on, and also chatting all the time because you should somehow <laughs> sustain this uh, social atmosphere. Uh, it means that actually, uh, pretty no uh, Soviet uh, woman. Uh, eight uh, decently on festive occasion. Uh, that's why, for example, um, pretty all uh, my informants, uh, my inter interlocutors, hate uh, the New Year's Eve because uh, they are cooking uh, they, uh, during the whole day uh, from the early morning till uh, till uh, 12 a.m. when uh, everybody is expected to, to sit at the table and they're just exhausted by this time. Want to go to sleep? That's all. I was wondering about the role of the mothers and the daughters in this period, and if the, the, you mentioned the one daughter who was very much deconstructing, but were some of them as, you know, in America in the 50s, little girls would go in the kitchen and learn to make cookies, that mm -hmm. kind of thing? Uh, it's it's an, an interesting question because, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there was a, this scientific shift of the expertise, and uh, the state, um, uh, the state, um, uh, affirm, uh, affirms that uh, mothers uh, they could teach their daughters, but uh, it's uh, unlimited stuff because they teach them uh, uh, not uh, scientific right things, but their own this domestic, atavistic, and so on stuff. That's why all those um, uh, skills and uh, knowledge uh, were uh, um, transposed into the school realm. There they, they began uh, classes of uh, domestic science and good housekeeping. Mm -hmm. And every uh, every Soviet uh, girl remembers vividly first awful uh, tries to uh, sew some some uh, some skirt or some apron uh, with uh, the old zinger machine uh, with uh, how say it, uh, food pedal. Uh, uh, or to uh, try to, to cook uh, omelette uh, uh, <laughs> under the, the white line, under the wagon of a uh, uh, very unhappy uh, woman who doesn't <laughs> care about all those school girls. So it's, it was quite a traumatic experience. But you know, in the okay. 50s and 60s, uh, I come from the generation where we had home economics and most of us hated it. Uh -huh. yeah, so. I love my home. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're like, perhaps. <laughs> I think that's the sleeve. So <laughs> in the beginning, you raised this kind of really interesting contrast with peasant cooking and peasant mm -hmm. households. But as far as I've seen, in, in peasant weddings or in you know, local village weddings, really conform to this. No, nobody. Yeah, I guess. I mean, so mm -hmm. could you just say a little more about that context? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that uh, it could be explained through the notion of downward mobility. 
than uh, some prestigious ideas, uh, concepts, and models like this one, uh, just soaked uh, uh, into uh, the lower social circles. And uh, perhaps uh, some, uh, some uh, peasant uh, could acquire uh, uh, these ideas about urban uh, cooking when either they children return uh, from uh, the big cities that they uh, get into the education, or when uh, they had um, the peasants themselves had uh, an ID actually, it's uh, 70s, right? Uh, 72. Uh, then peasants got uh, ID, the proper ID, that enables them to actually... Internal passport. Mm -hmm. Passport. Passport. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where they, they, they could go to cities, they could look uh, how the urban life uh, uh, is going on and so on. Uh, it, it's just some broad explanation. I think the downward mobility, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty sure that this works. I have two questions. One is, who washed the dishes? <laughs> and the second thing is, which is interesting, I was raised by a Russian father, but no, no mother, so, right? Italian mother, because he didn't hang around much. Mm -hmm. But anyway, my father never cooked, never washed any dishes, even though mm -hmm. he had children to take care of. But he wrote the recipes, mm -hmm. all these things, vas and borscht and summer borscht and this and that and the pickles. For your mother? No, for me. Oh, for he you. made this book for me. Mm -hmm. For the future. I wasn't cooking it then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? and, and here's a man. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's like, you know, he, he never, he, he gave his own paper plates. Uh -huh. You know, like his steak. And, and he was a Russian immigrant in, in the U.S.? Absolutely. He came here right after the revolution. And, and his wife was American? No. Italian, but she, Italian. Left, she left all the time. Uh -huh. it's, very, it's a very interesting case, actually, because I suppose that... Um, uh, the recipes that you mentioned. I still have them. I should have brought them. Yeah, yeah but the one you mentioned, they're like Russian. So thus he tried to uh, inculcate some Russian knowledge and knowledge about Russianness through food to you. Uh, to remember I think you just that missed it because I wasn't about to cook it. It, it, it's, 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 it's absolutely plausible, but his idea was about um, to translate, culture. to translate some culture in, in the form of uh, cooking recipes. I think so. Uh, because it, it's pretty the same situation with Italian diaspora here in uh, South Philly. Um, there, um, I live there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, I, uh, as, a, as a customer to some small uh, Italian pastry shop, um, discovered that they have uh, tons of uh, uh, American uh, cookies and cakes, uh, and perhaps 20% are Italian uh, of, of the range. Uh, but uh, it's a very um, specific Italian range. It's cannoli, that is signature stuff for Sicilian uh, cooking. It's um, uh, sfogliatelle, uh, small pastry, uh, sig also signature, sig signature dish for uh, South Florida, the Nap Naples and uh, Campania. So uh, through these uh, recipes, they somehow sustain and maintain their Italian identity. So uh, the only person who speaks uh, Italian in this shop is a granny of 75 or 79. Uh, everybody else uh, sp uh, speak English. So it's a way to somehow to... Uh, well, also because at that time, time, I was not allowed to speak Russian. It was J. Edgar Hoover's time. And then mm -hmm. at the time, if you have to change your name, you can't do anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a great example, actually. It was an amazing you. time period. I mean, uh -huh. Until Sputnik went up. When Sputnik <laughs> went up, you could be Russian. That's true. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you mentioned, you were almost about to mention toast. So my parents um, were born in 1956 and 57, and like every dinner that is in my house is like this. It's how I do dinners for my friends. Like, uh -huh. complete exact, like everything you're saying, exact abundance, my mom does everything, barely has time to sit down, except I noticed that now her female friends, like, oftentimes they'll be like, okay, I'll do the next serving of everything, and mm -hmm. you have a seat, so it's like this network mm -hmm. of mutual support, and also knowing each other's kitchen, mm -hmm. like, in a, like, very personal way, but only the women do that. And it also supports this whole social and horizontal border. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly, so it's like, kind of like community care, even yeah. though it's total individual center, mm -hmm. um, but in terms of you know, the myriad of toasts we do in a night. I think, like, number, you know, three of every, so, like, very uh, first toast to the mm -hmm. person while we're here, and then, like, the, yeah, then the mother of the 
person why we're here, and then always like third is mm -hmm. the hostess because mm -hmm. thank you for doing this. And so it's so part of the ritual. And mm -hmm. so you were saying that sometimes there wasn't like explicit complimenting. Mm -hmm. um, so just kind of thinking about like was that always um, was that built in in terms of toast culture in Russia mm -hmm. always to thank the hostess like, mm -hmm. right up there? Or did that kind of come? It is pretty often, yeah, but you, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's pretty often. Uh, but I think but, uh, here the situation is safe because um, uh, the, the toasting is a speed genre. You, uh, it's a very also, rigid form. Uh, you drink and, and you praise somebody. Uh, and uh, uh, um, so it's not like uh, just exchange about, oh, what a nice dish, what, what you put into it. It's like, now we, we should uh, somehow loud uh, some praise and uh, glorify our beautiful hosts uh, uh, and uh, you, Misha, and you, Gale, you are the best persons in the world, thank you, <laughs> but you invite us and uh, everything is so, so tasty. So, about politics, you know Vladimir Putin, but, so it, it, it's a specific genre, uh, uh, speech genre, uh, but um, uh, a very um, organized sequence. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, it, 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 it somehow um, uh, differs from, uh, from my argument. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but I think it, it's a, is it's it kind of like a speech ritual for mm -hmm. Jeff versus yeah. like a sincere compliment on the actual like complimenting is also kind of ritual. Yeah. It's a ritualized <laughs> stuff. <laughs> uh, good. Uh, and and it's in there. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, implementations. There are two very specific Russian uh, speak genres. Uh, lamentations mm -hmm. uh, and uh, appraisals. So, uh, <laughs> Birthday cool. wishes. Yeah. Yeah. Like this. <laughs> but lamentations is, is uh, one just uh, the most common. Uh, usually there's music of some kind. Like backgrounds are like plays and all that. Uh, in 70s. I know all my life wherever I go. You, know? you, you have so called magnitophone, and they were very, very rare in Russia. Really? In the um, Soviet Union. <laughs> I think you know, we've come to the end of our time. And we need to clean some stuff up, and we, need, we, to, should, we need to applaud before. I think we should let Harry. I mean, this, this, yeah. we're not, we should do what we're supposed to do. I just want to save her so that she can have some food. Oh, yeah. um, but no, I don't want to cut anything off if you want to continue, Masha. But I wanted to actually applaud her before. The audience completely disappeared. That was my my purpose, actually. Um, so.